Welcome again, everybody. Uh, we continue our workshop with a presentation by John Smith. John, burn loose, as they say in Dutch. Hello. Good morning, or whatever time zone you're in. Uh, hope you're well, and I'm glad you've tuned into this uh, very important conference. I'll just get my little speaker's notes here. Two things are remarkable about this conference, well, many things perhaps. One is that it is happening at all. This is the first time in living memory that the European left has organized a conference on the non-trivial subject of imperialism and working class solidarity. So the organizers deserve to be congratulated. I hope that this conference gives him impetus to a much needed and very much overdue debate on imperialism in Europe and what this means for the activity of socialists, working class and youth. This conference asks questions that one way or another have been around for a long time. For instance, the, the uh, conference call poses the questions very sharply. It asks, why is working class internationalism so difficult to achieve? What, why could workers so often be seduced by jingoism and xenophobia? Why do northern workers frequently behave indifferently towards the misery of workers in the global south? Very, very important questions. But before we sit in judgment on northern workers, Judgment Day has also come to the European left. Why have these questions been ignored for so long? And this neglect has many serious consequences. We face the crisis, the deepest crisis that capitalism has faced in its centuries of existence without a usable theory of imperialism able to explain it. Black Lives Matter, the response to the murder of George Floyd, the youth rebellion on climate change and many other instances give us examples of how, in times of systemic crisis, large sections of youth are drawn instinctively towards revolutionary ideas and solutions because they see more clearly than the rest of us that that is what is necessary, that is what is involved. Something which cannot continue won't. And the imperialist mode of living and the imperialist domination of the world cannot continue, and therefore it won't. It's moving into a crisis of dramatic proportions. And I think young people actually sense this in many, many ways more keenly than the generations who are about to dump the most gigantic uh, crisis into their laps. So the left has embraced Black Lives Matter and many, all manner of liberals have also thrown their arms around it, even uh, funds that are, even bodies that are responsible for managing the wealth of the ultra-rich are issuing statements explaining and expressing their support for Black Lives Matter. And the left has uh, tried to show that it is concerned uh, and aware of the importance of um, remembering the legacy of 19th and 20th century imperialism and the, how it continues to mark Western society and global society. But what I hear very little of from any section of the left is any explanation that it's still going on, that there is imperialism here in the 21st century. We're not just looking at the legacy of plunder and exploitation, wrecking the lives of millions and tens of millions as something that only happened in the 19th century or the 20th century. It is happening now. One really uh, clear example that you can all relate to, I've just been using quite a lot, the example of coffee. A cup of coffee costing £2.50 or €3, Euros, one cent of that will go to the farmer who actually grew that coffee. One cent. And according to Financial Times, that does not even cover their cost of production. 
They need world coffee prices to be about 60, 70% higher to cover their basic cost of production in places like Central America and other parts where coffee is grown. And it is interesting, uh, the incredible impoverishment of coffee farmers that this causes the fact that they get so little of the value which they generate through their work, labor. And this value magically appears as part of the gross domestic product of the coffee consuming countries. It's interesting, for instance, to look at the 30 billion uh, dollars, which is the total value of the world export coffee trade, with the size of the coffee industry, so-called, in the rich countries, which is 10 times greater. Some more than something around 250 billion is the size of the so-called coffee sector in the global economy. In other words, 10 times more revenues are being attracted by people who don't grow the coffee for, than those who actually grow it. Anyway, 25 million coffee farmers there are in the world, 30% of their coffee is consumed in Europe. That means that 7 million coffee farmers spend their entire lives producing coffee for the European markets, they and their families. And they live in extreme poverty, below the World Bank's own racist definition of absolute poverty. Coffee prices are bumping along lower or as low as ever in, in history. So there is just an illustration of how um, forms of imperialism wrecking the lives of uh, working people, in this case farmers in poor countries, is very much a continuing 21st century phenomenon. And all of you listening to this can think of dozens and hundreds of examples that prove this. So why do we only talk about it as if it's something that happened in the past? So, in other words, before we sit in judgment on the working class, we need to, to do a bit of self-reflection. The second uh, thing that makes this, this conference so important is the context it's taking place in. Context, I don't need to remind anybody, is crisis, economic crisis, political crisis, the global health emergency, ecological crisis, and you could add another long list. You could add moral crisis, the moral crisis of European civilization. I was, there's a powerful quote from Rosa Luxemburg where she says that when you take off the disguise, bourgeois civilization stands dripping in blood and wading in filth. And it is no different today. Bourgeois civilization that revealed itself in the horrors of World War One and World War Two, is no different, even more depraved. It's destroying the planet in front of your eyes and all they can do is lie about it. So there is a, definitely, I don't think anybody would disagree, a moral crisis as well. The global capitalist economy was already in intensive care before the coronavirus pandemic hit kept alive by extreme monetary conditions, negative real interest rates, whose main effect has been to inflate an even bigger asset bubble than the one that burst in 2007. And the huge growth of indebtedness in not just of governments, but particularly of corporations who've loaded up on cheap debt in rich countries, even borrowing money in order to buy back shares from shareholders, anything but actually invest in new, uh, uh, production expanding investments. Um, the rate of investment uh, in rich countries has been in decline for the past 20 or 30 years. More and more shifting production to low wage countries was a, a much uh, less risky uh, alternative way to boost profits than by uh, investing in um, in new expensive plants and machinery. So the investment rate has collapsed in order to replace the lack of the withdrawal of demand by private corporations, governments had to go deeper into debt and otherwise the uh, depression conditions would have, would have spread earlier. Anyway, it is no exaggeration to say that this crisis is the deepest and most extensive crisis that capitalism has faced in its several centuries of existence. 
some indications of, and this was, we are, we are talking about the crisis before the, the coronavirus pandemic actually hit. We just need to remember and recall that before the first, anybody started using the term coronavirus, now, most of the world was already in a state of stagnation. For instance, Latin America, according to the IMF, reporting in January of this year, real GDP per capita in the region has declined by 0.6% per year on average since 2014. So for five years in real GDP per capita terms, Latin America had already been sliding into recession. And they've just received, before the first virus uh, hits the ground in Latin America, the economic shockwave of the arrival of the virus in Europe uh, had already caused a dramatic economic crisis. The, IMF, uh, the International Labour Office estimated in mid-November, so mid-April of this year, uh, they, um, they reported that real GDP per capita, sorry, the ILO, International Labour Organization, estimated that in the first month of the coronavirus crisis, the income of informal workers fell by 60% globally. That's half of the global working class we're talking about here. Their income fell by 60%. They're already on starvation, subsistence, or below subsistence income, and their income declines by 60%, with a drop of more than 80% in Africa and Latin America, the effect of the lockdown in places like Peru, Ecuador, uh, South Africa which will exacerbate already high poverty rates in poorer nations, says the ILO. And since we're gathered to discuss working class internationalism and the need for solidarity with those in struggle and those who are in distress, we should acknowledge the enormous need for some of this working class internationalism and solidarity right now. The imperialist countries have spent so far, and there's probably going to be big bailout packages being prepared and will be necessary before many months are out, already $9 trillion have been spent on crisis mitigation in the imperialist countries. If you work it out per capita, it works out that many hundreds of times, hundreds of times more money is being spent per capita trying to mitigate the effects of this crisis than is being spent per capita to a to mitigate the effects of the crisis in poor countries like India or across Latin America. They have no resources. Capital had already fled before the coronavirus had even arrived, so they're even less able. And it is just amazing to me why there is not a scandal, why the left in its different guises uh, or disguises or whatever is not making a gigantic fuss about a situation where what has been the G7 or the rich nation's response to the dramatic impact of coronavirus on poor countries, which has seen their tourism collapse, have seen their currencies collapse, have seen their remittances on foreign on, on, uh, migrant labour's wages, which many, many millions and tens of millions of people rely on in poor countries, seen them collapse as well. Collapse of trade, biggest as i say i mean south africa reported a 50 percent decline in gdp in the second quarter of this year 50 percent india 30 percent figures like that across latin america so what help has been given to the poor countries in the situation the g7 the usa france germany holland etc have agreed to do this They've, Separating out the poorest countries of all, the so-called least developed countries, there's a group of about 100 of them, most of them in Africa. The only ones in Latin America are Bolivia, Nicaragua, Guyana, and Honduras. That's it. They're on this list to be eligible for the generosity of the rich countries. What does that generosity consist of? To give them a holiday on paying their debts until the end of this year not cancelling any single one of those monthly instalments of billions to the people they've borrowed from, but just to postpone it to the end of this year. Not only that, they have to pay interest on this. 
not only that, but only a small proportion of the debt which these poorest countries owe actually qualifies at all because the only debt that's being included is the debt that is provided by official bodies like the IMF, World Bank or governments. Most of the debt that the poor countries owe is to private sector, is to what we call loan sharks who are claiming earning higher than average interest rates because of the higher risk in involved in lending to poor countries. That's most of the debt that these poor countries owe. But the private sector is not being included. There was talk to begin with that they were hoping to set an example to the private sector and they encouraged them to join in. They refused point blank. Not a single sign of any interest from the private sector in uh, in even following the pathetic just a debt holiday until the end of the year they want their debt service their debt serviced in full and on time without a single day's delay and the effect of the government bodies giving debt holidays to poor countries is simply to enable those poor countries to be prompt in their repayments to the private sector so whatever generosity is coming from the rich countries is basically bailing out rich investors from rich countries in these poor countries and is not actually affecting the poor countries at all so that is the that's it they can queue up for imf loans and we all know what onerous sovereignty uh, negating conditions will be attached to any loans that, they, that the IMF distributes. So we have, therefore, it seems to me, a real need for solidarity. We need another, there is a new round of debt crises that will sleep, sweep through the, the, the global south. There is no doubt about this. They've piled up huge amounts of debt over the past 20 years, especially since the global financial crisis. And their economies are shrunk, they're no longer able to service these debts. Everybody is predicting there'll be a wave of debt crises. This will cause enormous distress on top of all the distress they're suffering from at the moment. And there'll be gigantic political consequences. Wars and revolutions will definitely come out of this. The, IMF, the, the World Bank says that the uh, debt crisis that is now facing Latin America is many times worse than the 1980s than the 1980s debt crisis that began when Mexico defaulted on its debts in 1981. So that is the uh, situation that we're in. We need solidarity, council with it. Now I need to keep an eye on my time. This is such a gigantic topic. All I'm going to be able to introduce is some ideas about how we need to, to address these big issues. Um, we need to, when we i think as is clear i enjoyed reading all of the papers uh, i think there's some great wisdom in every single one of them i think that uh, marcel's paper one of the many things that's interesting about that is its broad scope he actually looks back over the past 150 years and that is the, the sort of scope that we need to have when we approach the this problem we need to look at how the the history of the development of the um, of imperialism and its political impact and economic impact on the lives on the live on the lives and the politics of working class in Europe. Um, Kwame Nimako uh, in his um, paper points makes a very interesting point where he explains that in Europe each step towards democracy, each step towards recognizing the citizenship of the lower classes in European countries was accompanied by their inclusion in the imperial project. They were being, they became beneficiaries and protagonists uh, in many different ways. The extent of the, uh, <coughs> the huge numbers that actually went abroad as colonizers and settlers is just one example of this. Anyway, Engels in his correspond in correspondence with Marx, more than 100 years ago, commented that the English bourgeoisie obtains larger revenues from the tens and hundreds of millions of the population of India and of, of her other colonies than from the English workers. In these conditions, a certain material and the economic basis is created for infecting the proletariat of this or that country with colonial chauvinism. 
And that is undeniable, but we are, the left has been scared of actually confronting these uh, questions and has helped us. So we need to have a broad scope anyway. We need to actually study how we've got into this situation of the past 150 years. That involves actually looking at the history in, in separate phases. There's a huge amount of content, there's an important continuity to discover uh, with the origins of imperialism, the origins of capitalism two or three centuries ago. Also, we need to, clearly, it's obvious that we need to look at history as punctuated by enormously important milestones, particularly the World War I and World War II. Europe, the situation in Europe since World War II has been very different than the situation in between the wars. I would argue that in periods of social peace and steady growth, revolution is not on the agenda in Europe and other advanced countries or any other country in, if you have a period of social peace and steady growth. In the imperialist countries, they gave us reform because we would have given them revolution, to paraphrase uh, Lord Helsinger, a uh, notable English statesman of the 20th century. He was there talking about the decisions that the English ruling or the British ruling class made in the run-up to and during World War II to make uh, pensions and healthcare and the welfare state available to, uh, to the working class of England. Pensions and healthcare were conceded in order to get radical change off the agenda. And, they comp and the r rulers of Britain compensated themselves for this by becoming more imperialist. The impulse of the uh, dominant capitalist states to practice an imperialist uh, policies to try and exploit um, and siphon as much wealth as they can from poor countries, that only becomes amplified by concessions that they feel obliged to make at home in order to secure social peace. So I think it's really extremely important for people in Britain to recognise that the conquest of the NHS, of uh, um, free access to healthcare and other things, were um, very much a product of struggles, uh, class struggles and wars of liberation in many other countries, not just in Britain. The imperialists were convinced that they needed to make concessions to the British working class in order to form an alliance with them against the rest of the world. So the, as Kwame Nimako has pointed out, how uh, every step towards um, democracy in Europe has been accompanied by an attempt to involve wider and wider sections of the uh, population in uh, complicity with imperial projects, then very much the history of the working class in Europe over the 20th century has been that. The labor leaders, the trade union leaders and the main political parties have not just been passive supporters of foreign imperialist policy, but active participants in this. Um, a very good example of this, the personification of this is really Ernest Bevin, who was um, foreign minister in the post-World War II Labour Party government, helped to found NATO. But before that, he spent two, two decades as a general secretary of the, what became the biggest trade union in the United Kingdom. So he moved from being a general secretary of a trade union to being a, um, a chief imperialist in the Labour Party government. He helped to set in motion the, the ball rolling for what eventually led to the military coup in Iran in 1953. And uh, he was very clear that we needed to maintain Britain's imperialist possessions in order to finance the social reforms that were going on inside the United Kingdom in order to purchase social peace. Anyway, in periods of social peace and steady growth, revolution is not on the agenda. 
I refuse to believe that, uh, therefore, and, and that has been the situation that has pertained in Europe for most of the time since World War II. It's certainly not been the situation that's pertained in many other parts of the world where revolution has been on the agenda. In fact, revolution has really had its almost entire appearance uh, uh, and presence in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. I think if we look back at Europe since 1945, the closest we can get to a revolutionary situation would be Portugal after the collapse of the of its Spanish Empire in the mid 1970s. Um, however, the period between World War One and World War Two are very different from this. I refuse to believe that revolution was not on the agenda back then. I refuse to believe that the rise of fascism, the Holocaust, Franco's victory in Spain were inevitable. I think they could have been avoided. What weighed heavily during those years was the question of leadership or the lack of it. The weight, the heavy weight of the defeat, the, the capitulation of social democracy to World War I, and also the counter-revolution that took place in the Soviet Union following the death of Lenin, and the rise of Stalinism. These weighed very heavily. And these helped to explain why revolutionary openings that did exist in Spain, in Germany and other countries were not taken advantage of. I'm not saying it would have been an easy struggle. The, uh, the imperialists are the most ruthless, bestial uh, ruling class that's ever existed. When, uh, when they, were, they decided to bomb Vietnam back to the Stone Age rather than let the Vietnamese enjoy it. And it may be that some of them, at least, will be prepared to bomb the planet back to the Stone Age rather than let us have it. So it's a really serious situation. They are the people who rule us behind the democratic mass. They have not changed since Luxembourg described them. And so, anyway, so we need to look, learn different things from different parts of history. I just want to just, I suppose, conclude my attempt to locate this discussion in historical context and just mention one or two other things by referring to a, a great quote from Guyanese revolutionary Walter Rodney, who I think will help us give a sense of, get a sense of history, a historical perspective. He says that ever since the mid 19th century, Marx had predicted class collision would come in the form of revolution in which workers would emerge victorious. However, imperialism introduced a new factor into this situation, one that deferred the confrontation between workers and capitalists in the metropoles. I just think that is so much wisdom in those words. What I particularly like is where he says that the new factor, imperialism, deferred the confrontation between workers and capitalists in the metropoles. It deferred it. It deferred it for more than a hundred years. It deferred it until now. This crisis is the deepest crisis that capitalism has faced. There is no peaceful capitalist way out of this crisis. We are no longer in a World War II, post-World War II world. We're in a pre-World War III world that whatever the weakness of the subjective factor is, the absence of revolutionary leadership, the absence of revolutionary theory without which there cannot be a revolutionary movement. Nevertheless, objectively, the necessity for revolution is clearly posed by the depth of this economic crisis, by the uh, uh, capitalist destruction of nature, which is euphemistically called climate change. And I do believe that uh, whatever uh, material privileges, they are temporary. They certainly exist and they certainly have to be explained and have to be acknowledged. And, that, and the, their role in creating an aristocratic mentality has to be acknowledged. But they, compared to what capitalism has in store for workers, even in the imperialist countries, when Trump talked about American carnage, he won a lot of votes because he was telling the truth. That is carnage is what increasing sections of the working class of what of all colors of skin in the United States is actually experiencing right now. In those situations, especially with the arrival of the youth, and I think in many ways the working class has actually been strengthened by the development of history, despite the 
huge, huge divisions, the violation of our inequality. I haven't talked about, it was mentioned earlier on about why it's necessary to, to regard global imperialism as a form of apartheid on a global scale. Many people have used this example, but basically I'll just finish with this since I've got to finish soon and I've got to finish somewhere. And that is that I think the thing which drew me and uh, I guess everybody in this room and most people who are listening towards the socialist movement is because socialism is opposed to everything which violates the equality and therefore the unity of working class people. And that we can define socialism very usefully, I think, as the period of, of history in which we cons consciously struggle to eradicate and remove everything which violates the unity and equality of working people. That is why socialism has to be anti-sexist. That is why socialism has to be anti-racist, because these are fundamental divisions which violate our unity. But the biggest violation of our unity of all, the biggest violation of our equality of all, is that which is imposed upon the global working class by imperialism. If you're, uh, the workers in poor countries receive a tiny fraction they're living they even have to have a separate measure of poverty the absolute measure of poverty they couldn't apply, apply the same thing to the same human beings living in imperialist countries anyway i don't think i need to labor the point because i think you can all understand and see that these divisions are the most fundamental of all they make the biggest impact to your life chances your access to health care your living standards whether you are born in a rich or a poor country and the reason, one of the reasons I'll just finish why uh, uh, it's actually appropriate to use the term apartheid to explain this is that in many ways the apartheid system was a microcosm of the global imperialism. Second of all, apartheid was based on the uh, um, denial of citizenship rights to the black majority. They were forced to live in Bantustans and they were not considered to be citizens of 87% of South Africa, which was under white control. And the whole purpose of this was to maximize the uh, accumulation of capital to extract every drop they could out of the, out of the sweat and the blood of African workers. And that is an analogy to the situation on a global scale. The same past laws, restrictions on the free movement of labour that we saw. John, John. Uh, so, okay, I'm, I, so there is a justification, but I'm looking forward very much to hearing some discussion and please write to me as well if you wish. Thank you. Uh, now we'll hear what Kavi Yazdani has to say about this. Yes, well, first of all, thanks a lot for the invitation to Marcel and SOC21, and also thanks a lot for the presentation by John Smith. So um, a lot of what um, I'm going to say has already been at least partly touched upon by John. Um, so uh, let me begin and uh, see how this goes. So with uh, the 2016 publication of a seminal monograph titled Imperialism, in the 21st century, globalization, super exploitation, and capitalism's final crisis, John Smith put the role of imperialism center stage. Contrary to eminent Marxist scholars such as David Harvey and Robert Brenner, he argues that imperialism is an integral component of today's socioeconomic relations and structures, generating huge profits, especially for US and European transnational corporations. Smith highlights that in advanced capitalist countries, both multinational companies and wage laborers live at the expense of the super exploited labor force in the global south, resulting, resulting in an, quote, apartheid like global economic system. He shows how cheaply available consumer goods such as coffee, as well as Britain's health insurance benefits via tax revenue, are connected to outsourcing um, and global labor arbitrage. That is the low remuneration of uh, remuneration and super exploitation of laborers in the global south. Thus, with but also beyond Marx and reminiscent of Lenin and Argiri Emmanuel, he emphasizes the necessity of developing a value theory of imperialism to calculate the international uh, variations in the value of labor power and in the rate of exploitation. 
This is an important endeavor because, as Smith underscores, international wage differentials between industrialized and developing nations vastly exceed price differences in all other global markets. According to Smith, global differences in real wages between imperialist uh, and developing countries often amounts to more than 10 to 1 and never less uh, than 3 to 1. Although Smith admits that the rising global industrial reserve army leads to wage dumping, he criticizes nationalist tendencies within the social democratic and socialist left, including Jeremy Corbyn's concession to trade unions and the Labour Party to move away from the free movement of labour, as well as Jean-Luc Mélenchon's critical position vis-à-vis -vis mass immigration. In this context, we may add two of Germany's most popular and populist left politicians, Sarah Wagenknecht and Oskar Lafontaine. It is striking that those within Die Linke who oppose Western imperialism often make up the same people who are rather hostile to refugees and immigration. These tendencies reinforce the antithetical anti movement towards what Smith calls, quote, a world without borders to everything and everyone except for working people. End of quote. Against this backdrop, <clears throat> Smith reminds us that both Marx and Lenin were well aware that workers of different nations were played off against each other by the bourgeoisie and the mass media outlets it possessed or had under control a process which weakened the global labor movements and bolstered the capitalist elites. However, the question of how the problem of mass immigration needs to be tackled in the face of a thriving radical right throughout the West remains pertinent and so far no satisfactory response seems to be in sight. So in what follows, I will focus on five major points of contention and suggest the need of expanding upon some of the underlying socioeconomic and political problems at stake. So this is rather based on um, the pre-circulated paper by John Smith and less on the presentation right now, which, as I already said, responds to some of these um, points of contention, or at least shows that there might be less points of contention than I thought before. So firstly, Smith contends that uh, quote, the principal lines along which the unity and equality among working people is violated are gender, race, and empire. However, it is not clear to me why the category of class is omitted. There are noticeable numbers of well-to-do non-whites and women in the global north and global south that are economically better off than segments of the white working classes in Euro-America. Furthermore, the, econ the economic rise and capital investment of Japan, South Korea, China, India, the United Arab Emirates, and Saudi Arabia, in the US, Europe, Latin America, and Africa, demonstrate that the antagonisms between East and West, or the global North and global South, or as Luca proposes, the first and third world, only explain part of the story. Arguably, the global national bourgeoisie often share similar interests. The so-called labor aristocracies aside, the same could also be said about segments of the global working classes the world over. What also needs to be added, I think, is the category of uh, citizenship, uh, citizenship, and I'm glad that John Smith just alluded to that. So indeed, some, to some extent, white non-citizens from the peripheries, that is from Eastern Europe, Latin America, or Central Asia, are more discriminated against than non-white citizens, including black and brown people with passports from the US or European states. Secondly, for Smith, imperialism is the contemporary concrete stage of development of the capitalist mode of production. However, there are other important developments that would also merit to be included in the current stage of capitalism if we don't want to lose sight of some of the new developments that evolved over the past 50 years. As to the periodization of capitalism, employing the concept of socioeconomic formation, perhaps better captures the pre- and non-capitalist tendencies, as well as rampant contradictions that simultaneously coexist in the present. It's a con concept that the late Marx increasingly used instead in, in place of mode of production. Hence, although the prevalence of capitalism un is undisputed today, while globally free labor is on the rise, it nonetheless coincides with unfree, coerced, bonded, self-employed, and hybrid forms of waged and unwaged labor. What is more, the COVID-19 crisis is in the midst of weakening the prevalence of free labor. 
Apart from that, alternative traje trajectories such as budding subsistence economies trying to escape the logic of capital and market dependence are equally growing in the interst interstices of the capitalist world economy, as has been pointed out by Ulrich Brandt and Markus Wissen. It is worth mentioning that neoliberal ideologies coexist with soaring examples of illiberal democracies, also known as political capitalism, as in the case of the US, Brazil, or Hungary. Furthermore, imperialist predation, exploitation, and unequal exchange unfold along an information age that emerged from the 1960s and is a central characteristic of the current stage of capitalism. It earmarks the shift from the industrial sector to services and finance, increased global division of labor and commodity chains, as well as an unprecedented rise in productivity and advancements in the productive forces, resulting from automation, digitization, robotization, improved means of telecommunication and organization, and early advances in the development of artificial intelligence. Thirdly, while Smith highlights the devastating effects of imperialism on social relations of production, he says little on extra economic force and the, uh, the political economy of military violence, at least in the paper, not in the presentation as you've heard. The latter, however, plays an important role in the emergence of terrorist organizations such as Al-Qaeda and ISIS, provokes the flight of thousands upon thousands of war refugees to Europe, and as a result also critically impacts the strengthening of the ultra-right. According to Smith, the quote, deepest root of capitalism's imperialist impulse is in the capital labor contradiction and not in rivalry between capitalist classes slash states, end of quote. Although the capital relation is indeed central, it would be a mistake to gloss over the major role of states, institutions, and force in facilitating imperial domination and expanded reproduction on an ever-increasing scale. As Smith's, as Smith's theory of imperialism is rooted in Marxian thought, it is important to remember Marx's following assertion, quote, in actual history, it is a notorious fact that conquest, enslavement, robbery, murder, and short force play the greatest part, end of quote. Since the 2003 publication of David Harvey's The New Imperialism, it has become fashionable to see extra economic force as a outgrowth of ongoing processes of original or primitive accumulation. But for Marx, the phase of original accumulation was a period of transition. In the specific case of Europe, it roughly spanned the 16th to the 19th centuries. This development led to the prevalence of capitalist social relations. However, there is no need to invoke the term original accumulation for developments in advanced capitalist nations. By contrast, extra economic violence is part and parcel of imperialism and capital accumulation proper. Thus, coming back to the political economy of violence, the neo-colonial wars and interventions in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya, and Mali demonstrate how destructive imperialist policies have been since the 1990s, particularly in large parts of West Asia and North Africa. This process was intimately related to the passage from a bipolar to a US-dominated unipolar world after the fall of the Soviet Union. In effect, the bloody geopolitical facts on, and figures on the ground suggest that brute force should be a central pillar of a new theory of ongoing imperialism. As the economist Mehta de Wahabi aptly points out, and I will quote him here in extenso, contrary to potlatch, that is a ritual destruction of property, strategic destruction or destructive entrepreneurship in a capitalist economy is not anti-economic. It is conducted with the intention of breeding new market opportunities. In this sense, it is part of the process of market creation. In this process, the, the introduction of new products precedes the destruction of old ones. In war destruction, the Schumpeterian process of creative destruction is inverted since the destruction of old products precedes the re reconstruction of new ones. While creative entrepreneurship promotes the market through creative destruction, Destructive entrepreneurship promotes the market outlets through destructive creation. In a capitalist economy, destructive creation may lead to war economies in which waging wars may be more important than winning them." End of quote. Fourthly, Smith correctly points out that scholars such as Charles Betzelheim and Alex Kalinikos are mistaken in assuming that the rate of exploitation in higher or more advanced capitalist uh, economies um, 
that uh, exploitation is higher in, 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 in more advanced capitalist economies. But she also contends that the global north does not create more value than the global south by trivializing greater levels of qualified and complex labor in the former. However, it is precisely the higher rate of labor productivity and techno-scientific innovation that constitutes control over the labor process on equal exchange and different global power relations. As a result of superior forces of production, human capital formation, more efficient institutions, military superiority, the effects of brain drain, etc., relative surplus value and real subsumption of labor under, cap, on, uh, under labor, uh, real subsumption of capital under labor are more advanced in the US, Northwestern Europe, China, Japan, and South Korea. And this is also why their transnational corporations and slash or states to differing degrees dominate the world's economy and maybe with the exception of China, represent the most advanced forms of capitalist development. Fifthly, according to Smith, socialism is synonymous with anti-imperialism. This is so because socialism, and I, I quote him here, is the conscious struggle against everything that violates the unity and equality of proletarians and the legacy and actuality of imperialism in this, in the, uh, is the source of the gravest violations of our equality and the greatest obstacle to our unity, end of quote. However, we should not ignore reactionary forms of anti-imperialism either, as in the case of Ayatollah Khomeini and his successor Khamenei. What is more, for a large number of activists and revolutionaries, socialism has not just been the fight for social justice, but also for freedom and basic human rights. For over a billion people in many parts of East and West Asia, as well as Africa, despotism is as grave as imperialism. Therefore, political struggle is not just the struggle to overthrow the dictatorship of capital, as Smith contends, but also the struggle to get rid of predatory regimes, as in China or Iran. They, they, that cannot be equated with the sheer interest of capital. In the spirit of Lenin, and, uh, in the spirit of Lenin Smith emphasizes that the, syst the system systematic plunder of the living and natural wealth of nations are dominated and oppressed by imperialism, and that capitalism's imperialist trajectory narrows the scope for increases in the real wages and access to health and education. But this is only one side of the coin. In the case of Iran, for example, internal impediments are even more pertinent than imperialism, sanctions, and the Trump administration's maximum pressure. Indeed, if we compare different oppressed countries with each other, we can see that in those nations where the political establishment is more or less independent, the degree of coercion is quite different. Take, for example, Cuba and Iran. Both countries have been subject to severe pressure and sanctions from the U.S. empire for decades. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I finish, finish it. Uh, and both are highly repressive vis-a-vis -vis dissidents. The dissident prison, uh, prison population of these two countries is among the highest in the world, while Iran has even the highest per capita execution rate on earth. Nonetheless, uh, the Cuban system with universal access to healthcare and education, its inroads to scientific developments, and even helping other countries with medical care providers is a novel and progressive endeavor launched with egalitarian and socialist objectives. So I, I'll just finish up with a final um, sentence. So in short, although racial discrimination, patriarchy and super exploitation in the global south are being reinforced by capitalism and imperialism, the capital relation is not its only cause. Therefore, I would like to repeat Marx's categoric imperative to overthrow all relations in which man is a debased, enslaved, abandoned, despicable essence. Thanks for your attention. You began by talking about the, the issue of immigration and that is an enormous, extremely important issue and it is at the centre of the topic of this, uh, uh, <coughs> of this conference. Um, the, the immigration really is a, a huge test of solidarity. I think it's uh, it's been pointed out, and it still is important to to recall just how many more migrants are being accommodated, people who are taking refuge from from disasters and wars how many more of them are being accommodated and looked after, to some degree at least, in neighbouring poor countries compared to the, 
much much uh, smaller fraction that are um, that are able to to find a place of refuge in imperialist countries. Um, when the uh, Cubans are asked how uh, why they devote such resources to sending so many doctors to poor countries, uh, they say in response, we share what we have, not what's left over. That is our principle. And it is extremely difficult to apply that principle to the issue of migration. But solidarity means nothing unless it's extended to those who need it the most. And migrant workers need solidarity pretty well more than any other section of the working class because their whole conditions of life are violated. It's, it's possible to go through, for instance, the, United, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and check off which, which of them impacts on migrant workers particularly. And you can say that every single one of them does. There is no human beings on this planet that are more systematically denied basic human rights than migrant workers. And we know that the, the, uh, the, the causes and the reasons that have given rise to this. There are no simple solutions. There is no solution under capitalism to this problem. Um, I think that uh, the, the paper by Brandon uh, and Wissen is very, very interesting. They've got some very interesting uh, uh, comments and insights and wisdom about the drivers of migration and the desire of workers in poor countries, uh, many of them, to get a piece of the imperial mode of living. I remember reading an interview, uh, 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 an opinion poll in Peru. They were asking young people which of them would... Uh, um, dream of migrating to the United States or to another rich country and they found a large majority dreamed of migrating from their country. That shows the tragedy of how many hundreds of millions of people feel they have no future in their own countries. What's really required is a revolutionary perspective for all of those countries as well. That uh, really um, the uh, I would imagine that as a result of some of the huge uprisings of young people, uh, massive social movements that have racked countries like Peru, Ecuador, Lebanon, and so on, that you ask young people uh, following those experiences, they'd be much more likely to want to stay in their countries. They see a perspective there with a new generation of people fighting for profound transformations to try and uh, overcome the problems which have set so many migrant workers in motion. So what I'm trying to say, I think that we need to, uh, the, the, the task of solidarity is an imperative and we have to confront it. We, they deserve and require solidarity. If we cannot extend solidarity to migrant workers, then the word has no meaning. But it is a gigantic challenge and we have to recognise that the struggle for a world without borders is a struggle for a socialist world. And uh, it, it needs to be integrated into a, an internationalist um, perspective of tackling the, the root causes that give rise to migration and educating people in rich countries about well let's sum, summarize my point on this because there's so much, so much that needs to be said about it there was a, a big protest at a g7 summit uh, a decade two decades ago i think led in germany by the uh, by migrant workers who create who made a big uh, banner saying we are here because you have destroyed our countries so the, imp the role of imperialism in actually creating the wars and creating the conditions of extreme underdevelopment uh, which have turned into major drivers of migration needs to be fully acknowledged uh, John, uh, uh, yeah. John uh, we have some more questions so if you Okay. Right. I'll just. I should. I, there was another five or six points that Cave <laughs> made. So. Uh, okay. I will therefore uh, let me just think. I liked his points. I agreed with much of them. I think you're right. Yes, I. There's not much said in the book directly about imperialist violence, actual violence, extra economic coercion, as you put it. I think it is present in my book, and I also think that one aspect of it is emphasized and that is the daily 24 hours a day violence that takes place along the borders between rich and poor countries um, that is a 24 hour round the clock military operation of the 
enormous scale to try and prevent workers from crossing through borders which rich people can cross through and commodities and capital can but which borders cannot. I'll, uh, I'll just I've got um, a note of questions that I've not addressed. Yeah, he, had, so. he had so many points it's uh, difficult to answer them briefly. Uh, sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but now we turn to Uli Brandt, who also has a question. And Mark is also, okay. Yes, thank you for the... And we have five minutes left. Contribution for the and for the, um, for the comment. Uh, I would like to um, um, underline what um, John said about Peru. I would also say I was at this conference in Latin America and there was a very interesting contribution on Cuba. And also in Cuba, the everyday discourse is that young people want to migrate. And now with the COVID crisis, they, they, they cannot. Yeah? And um, that Cuba lives very much of remittances of people who are already outside. And this is um, yeah, also um, shapes a bit the perspective. I have two points. The first is, um, maybe I got it wrong, but um, John, I would, you argue that uh, migration, immigration is weakening wor the worker struggles. And I would argue, and you know this field much, uh, this field much better, no, the immigration and migrants might induce a new form of worker struggles. Because the danger is to objectify them, to say the migrants, yeah, they want something in our societies. But what we know in Germany, Austria, is that it's a, they also are self-organized, some of them. They try to change something to, to, um, to defend their interests. And I think that um, with this tone, migrants are um, weakening struggles. We, we omit this. And the second point, I'm happy that you um, mentioned this. Maybe now it's not the time, but later on, the question of the state. I was a bit surprised that it's absent in the papers, in the other papers. And you reduce a bit the state to violence, but also in the response to John. But what is also the state functions and the internationalized state, the multi, multi, multi-scalar states in the, um, uh, in the uh, reproduction of the imperial mode of living or of imperialism? Yeah, it's, um, I, maybe I got it wrong, but you reduced it a bit to open violence, to coercion, but what are also how the states in different historical phases um, are constituting the preconditions of, of, uh, of global uh, capitalism. Thank you, uh, Uli. Then, Markus? Thank you for the, for the presentation and for the, for the comments. I had a, my, my question refers to the strategical implications of, of um, your analysis, John. In one part of your paper, you write about the um, complex dialectic relationship between the economic struggle and the political struggle of trade unions and workers. I think this is a very important point. Yeah. But I have not understood how exactly you understand this dialectic. Um, my impression is that trade unions and workers can indeed contribute to the emancipatory struggle if they overcome this divide between economic and or mere economic, mere political struggle, for example, in the form of social movement unionism. So my question would be, what are the strategic implications of your analysis? And what in particular are the strategic implications for the role of workers, trade unions, in alliances with other emancipatory forces in a struggle for a fundamental transformation direction of a, a socialism? John, you have the final words. Okay. I have, I have just two, two minutes. Right. right. Two minutes. As a trained agitator, you must be able to do this. Start my, my video. video. Well, very, very, very quickly. Good. Good. Migration, I think, has enormously strengthened the working class in Europe since World War II. One of the most important transformations that's taken place in the working class has been its growing cosmopolitan character and how we are connected in so many different ways, culturally, uh, economically, politically, socially, across borders. That has been a process that has uh, been taking place on a on a multi-dimensional scale, especially since World War II. And it ranks also with another transformation of the working class that we've seen over the past decades. And that is the feminization of the working class with women much more fundamentally 
part of the the, the working class. When my, when migrants from all parts of Africa and Asia and Latin America bring their experiences and their memories and their um, uh, uh, the lessons they've drawn from previous phases of of the last 150 years from their perspective, from a southern perspective, when they bring that into the heart of the uh, working class movements and populations of rich countries, that enormously, uh, it's one of the most positive developments of the past 60, 70 years and something we should celebrate and give us, uh, it gives, I think, cause for us to call it a, a cause for optimism since we're all looking around for that. So. I think migration has strengthened the working class. However, it does weaken the working class uh, in, the, in its economic battle. It's like if you've got a, a situation where there's a shortage of work. I mean, the imperialists consciously use immigration to try and drive down working class living standards. Like they've used it consciously in Europe. One of the main uh, motives for the eastward expansion of uh, of the EU has been to try and bring Western workers' wages into more direct competition with the wages which uh, workers in Eastern Europe are prepared to accept. And I think there's a lot of things in Ben Selwyn's uh, article on this that are really interesting. Uh, so it does weaken the working class in its economic battle to maintain its position within capitalism, but it strengthens the working class in its political struggle to overcome capitalism. Now, there's not much of that struggle going on, but I think that the objective changes weaken us, weaken the social contract that binds us to imperialism and also uh, objectively act in favour of, I'm not saying there's any inevitability about this, of the working class acting as an international force, because unless working class learns how to do that in the next decades, then there is no future for humanity because only workers and only the working class globally is going to save this planet, not the bourgeoisie. If they're left in power, there is no future. Okay. So on the second question, I'll finish on the second question, the social movement. Uh, social movement unionism now, I think, some by, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah the, the, it's the, it's, Working class conscious political forces, trade un uh, socialists, I mean, and also trade union organizations worthy of the name need to lead the struggles against police brutality, need to lead the struggles for climate uh, against the climate destruction, need to develop a, uh, a, a perspective which is internationalist and actually confronts the real problems that working people are facing, which is precisely police violence and uh, um, and climate catastrophe and all of the other ills and the lack of, of guaranteed healthcare facilities uh, uh, and so on and so forth and it's to develop a perspective that integrates those things and I, I think actually a very useful way to look at it, a very useful uh, sort of question to ask yourself everybody individually and to discuss it amongst yourselves is what would we put into a communist manifesto for the 21st century if, we're going to, if we were going to sit down and try and write a 50-page or 30-page Communist Manifesto for the 21st century, what should go into it? And it's a very useful way to pose these questions because that is it's within that kind of a perspective and only that, that's, uh, that perspective that we'll be able to find answers and create a future for humanity. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. This is a very uh, educated... Uh, 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 no, um, constructive <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, notes. Uh, so we now have a break until 20 past two, and then we hear Ben Selwyn and the comments of uh, Kwame. Thank you. <laughs>